yeah, I've been good. You know, just uh, life is good right now. So how about yourself? Yeah, things are going good. And, um, you know, just working with a great local nonprofit and, um, you know, looking to find ways to stay plugged in politics because, you know, that's my true love. My true love is being a public servant and, you know, being politically engaged and make sure people stay, you know, active in I became a precinct delegate after I lost my election last year. And I'm just like, well, I got to keep the finger to the pulse, make sure that people know what the issues are and, you know, just getting out there and talking to people um, about, you know, what's important. So, so yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm excited to be here. Um, I love having these kind of conversations. So. Awesome. And that's the whole point. Um, and I'll get into that once we go live. Um, it's the whole point of this is to be able to have these kind of nice candid conversations with people. And honestly, to start it off, it's just me talking to my friends and people in my circle and just like, you know, very natural. And um, I don't know, I'm still trying to tweak the format of the show to make it a little bit more conversational too. Um, so yeah, we, we're just going to get in there. I'm not going to, hey, T, all right. Okay, you you're in the <laughs> chamomile. I gotta calm down at the end of the day after going like <laughs> all right. This Zoom meeting slash podcast slash webisode is now live. Welcome everybody to Quick to Politic. I am your host, Ernestine Lyons, and uh, we this is a social commentary show that talks all things politics, uh, business, development, you know, the world. Uh, it's all about bringing global, local, and I'm joined by a very special guest, uh, my friend since our days at Wayne State, uh, um, Esmat Ishag Osman. You know, I just want to have you tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, we'll we'll jump right into some questions. Yeah, I wanted to have you on the show for a while because um, I don't know, you you've been able to translate a career as a PhD into, you know, real world applications. And so I'm very excited to have you come on and talk about uh your research, your 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 path. That's been really exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Ernestine. And and um I've been I've been looking forward to get on your on your podcast show for you know for a while. I know we've been talking about it for a little bit, so I love having these kind of conversations. So I'm super excited and happy to be here. Um, and yeah, we've known each other since Wayne State and NLC New Leaders Council. Yeah, yeah, Detroit. Oh my gosh, I forgot about New Leaders Council. Yeah. You were in New Leaders Council and MPLP. Yeah. Oh yeah, wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, All right. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> uh, we've gone. We we've had a lot of the same path for sure. And then you know, I, both of us were in academia and then public service. And um, and so yeah. So my name is Asma Ishag Osman. Um, I am the Detroit Bureau Research Associate for the Citizens Research Council of Michigan. So what that is, we are a NGO think tank. Uh, policy think tank, uh, been around for 106 years, um, and so we we you know we've we've been we've been around for a long time. Um, my job is focused on policy for the city of Detroit specifically. So it's the Citizens Research Council. We have uh, a handful of research associates um, who are all focused on specific issue areas such as infrastructure, public health. Uh, education financing, local government, um, state finances, and my wheelhouse is Detroit more generally. Uh, so um, in a way, my job can be a little easier or a little harder because I have all these great resources uh, uh, at my accessibility at the organization, but I also have to kind of dab into all of those issue areas specifically for Detroit. So. Um, as you mentioned, I, I did transition in the industry from academia, so I received my PhD uh, from Wayne State uh, last year. I completed that last year um, in political science. Um, my major was in American government, minored in uh, urban and comparative politics. And, you know, I, I don't know whether you wanted me to wait to kind of get into kind of that journey of how I ended up here. Um, no, let's just jump right in. Like, honestly, that was right going to be like, just for the audience out there, my first question was, 
um, you know, just kind of a lot of times there's a lot of research in the world of like academia, but it's just like, how do you actually translate that into things that bring about meaningful policy change? And, you know, I think that's, that's kind of just like the essence of what ESMAT does and, you know, just kind of wanted to talk about that and uh, expound on it. So absolutely jump right on in. <laughs> so, so I would say that my path, a lot of it was when I, when I started my PhD journey, I was very naive and did not really know what I wanted to do with my PhD, right? And I think at the end of the day, that is how, you know, with, if you are going down the path of getting a PhD, um, you have to know what, why, what you're getting it for. You really do have to have a specific vision for why you are getting such a degree, because I'm not going to lie to the audience out there. Um, there are instances where it can be a waste of your time and money, right? Quite frankly, in my opinion, I actually think a master's is a more pragmatic degree to get, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, so I, I went to Michigan State, go green, go white. I received my uh, bachelor's in political science pre-law. Um, graduated 2012, took a gap year, moved back home um, in Ann Arbor, uh, was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do with myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was urged by my mom, uh, I come from an immigrant family, I'm a first generation immigrant in this country, that as I'm figuring out what I want to do, maybe you should just go back to grad school, you know, and around that time, 2012, the economy also wasn't doing well, it was hard to find a job. And so that could buy you some time. And so uh, in the spirit of immigrant families, um, you know, they always push you to become some sort of a doctor. And so <laughs> I was like, you know what, maybe I'll get a PhD in political science. Um, that's what I did in undergrad. And let's just see where this takes me. So if I could ask just was like it seems like um you know you had this pre-law background and so was there always this interest in um you know just politics and you know just policy and just being political no uh originally I wanted to become a lawyer well so, well, so originally I went down the path of becoming a medical doctor um uh I come from two generations of medical doctors in the family. Um, and so, right. and so the pressure was on there, right? Pressure was on, you're gonna be a doctor, it's set in stone. And I got to Michigan State and within my first semester of doing chemistry, I was like, "That's this is not for me at all, right? So again, in the spirit of coming from an immigrant family, often you have certain paths that your family urges you to go down, right? Whether it's medicine, engineering, law. And so, you know, I figured, you know, with my personality and I like to talk a lot. I was like, why not go down law? Um, come 2012, my senior year of college, one of my law professors was just very frank with me and had just let me know, you know, the, 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 the field, the law industry, the law field right now is, is you're going to go to school, you're going to go to law school, you're going to take out all of these loans um, and it's not going to give, you're not going to get the return that you are expecting. Um, the field is too flooded right now. There are a lot of lawyers that are not working. And I think this vision of what you have a lawyer to be is not necessarily accurate of what actually a lawyer does. And so that kind of took me for a loop. And I did a lot of like side, I was entrepreneurial my senior year of college. And I thought I was going to continue to do that. So me truly going into that PhD program was more of an effort to just get into something and quite frankly, just kind of appease my parents at that point in time. Look, I'm doing something, right? And I'm headed down this path of getting this prestigious degree. So I had no idea how difficult that the PhD would be. I had no idea of the limited kind of possibilities at that point in time that a PhD could grant you for the amount of money and time that it would take to finish something like that in energy. Right. Right. And for like <laughs> viewers out there, it's just like a lot of times if you go and get a PhD, you're going to end up just being a researcher. You're going to be a tenure track professor. Prof being a, ten a tenure track professor is sort of the like ideal, you know, place that you want to end up. Yeah. You, you know, and you spend all this time and effort and years of research putting into, 
you know, work in academia and always be teaching, always be researching and, you know, not necessarily looking at careers outside of that. Absolutely. And, and now it's less being a tenure rather than an adjunct professor. So now you have a lot of individuals that spend years going through a PhD program to become to become an adjunct professor. And for those who don't know what that is, it's essentially a professor at lease, right? Like you're you're leased out or you're rented out by a university to be come in and be a lecturer or or a professor at that institution for a year and you just kind of bounce around. So it's not a fun life to live. And so nevertheless, um I applied to Wayne State, and the reason why, you know, Wayne State was the first place that I thought of going was because Wayne State is the reason why my family is here. Um, we were, we came from Ghana in 1998. My mom got an opportunity to get her PhD from Wayne State, and so Detroit and Wayne State is the reason why we are even in this country. There was also the bankruptcy that was going on. And I'm not gonna ah. sit here, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that I was so aware of that, that I knew mm -hmm. the, the opportunity that that would ultimately provide me. But as a 22 year old at that point in time, there was just kind of this sense that Detroit was, a, was kind of an open slate. There was like a buzz that Detroit was about to go through something major. Right. Right. And you know what? It's it's funny. I'm sorry to like cut in, but um, you know, I, I kind of broached this topic because I see that a lot of your research focuses on like fiscal policy. And, you know, it's I don't think we realize because I'm a millennial, I'm in my 30s. And so it's just like we were living that history. And sometimes when you're living through something and you're from Detroit, you don't necessarily realize the impact of it. And then it wasn't until I recently saw a documentary that I'm probably going to bring up a little later as we get into more questions. Um, but this documentary was just like the whole story of what caused the bankruptcy, what is the outcome, what happened all during this. And I'm just like, dang, I remember that. I remember this, you know, feeling where you could it was palpable like that people were losing their pensions and you know you could feel their pain you could feel the sense of distress and panic that was sitting in not only in Detroit but also in the outer and suburbs and so you know we were all just in the sense of like wow this is really happening and it's surreal when yeah. you're going through it and you kind of forget yeah I mean at, at that age at that time um at least for me, I had zero awareness that something that historic was happening in the city and not in a good way, right? Like uh, a city filing for bankruptcy and then Detroit becoming the largest city to do that is not a good thing, but it's historic nonetheless. Um, but, you know, and, and prior to that, our only knowledge, at least mine, coming to this country in 98, being in Detroit around that time, I, I knew to, Detroit to be something else, right? Uh, you know, you would, you you wouldn't necessarily go downtown, right, and go kick it downtown Detroit to go to restaurants there. You you'd go to Royal Oak or whatever the case. Right, might be. right, and and it's so funny because like my parents like grew up in Detroit. You know, my dad's from Alabama, but my mom born and raised in Detroit. And like when I started going to Wayne State when I was like twenty. Um, they were just like, oh, stay away from Cass Corridor, you know, come right, you know, I was one of those commuting students who stay with their parents longer, and uh, it was just like, mm -mm, no, yep. and yep. it's not, it's not what it is today, so. No, everything has changed, a lot has changed, you know, but so, the, but nevertheless, there was still something that felt like it made sense to go to Wayne State, especially for a political science PhD, because I always had this vision that if I'm going to get a PhD in something that is as practical as political science, then I should be somewhere where I can have the opportunity to practice it practically, if that makes sense, right? So, you know, I don't know and I, and I think the reason why I thought that Wayne State in Detroit would offer me that opportunity is because Wayne State is a research institution in the heart of a city, right? I didn't think going to U of M or Michigan State could offer me that same sort of opportunity because I come from an academic family and I see, 
you know, that classic trope of sitting in the ivory tower. Um, that's what happens when you're an academic sitting in the ivory tower. You're just kind of theorizing and writing and researching about things, but you don't, you know, if you don't practice it, if you're not living it, if you're not on the ground doing it, then, you know, there is something to be said about how much, you know, how much understanding that you lack about those topics. And in something like political science, you know, I thought that it would be very important to get that sort of experience. And so I started my graduate program uh, uh, fall of 2013 at Wayne State, and I was very intentional, um, you know, and I ended last year. So it was a good, it was a good eight years in terms of a journey. Um, went straight from a bachelor's to a PhD. And I was very intentional that entire time of always being in civic spaces in the city while I was doing the kind of academic work that I was doing, learning about American government or learning about politics or learning about bureaucracy or learning about community organizing or public policy. And so, so that's essentially what I did um, and I also got the opportunity to work in certain grant programs while I was in my program that really, right now there's kind of a shift going on in academia, right? So like you mentioned before, usually when you're in academia, you have this track towards becoming a professor, staying in academia. Well, now there's a paradigm shift happening in academia where the academy is starting to realize that, you know, it's important for students to start looking at options outside of academia because there are just not as many good academic jobs available. Um, and I got the opportunity to work on a lot of those grant programs. So my I, the curtain was kind of pulled back for me at a very early point in the program where then I just kind of realized I'm going to utilize this education not to continue working in academia, but so that at some point in time, hopefully I can become like a high level community organizer or well, I can be in public right. policy. And that's essentially what happened. That real world application. And I remember you, um, I'm not sure if you started this program, but because I remember at Wayne, um, there was like, there were these meetups where it's just like, what do you want to do? And what are some paths? And what are ways we can pair you with mentors? What are ways that you can, you know, direct yourself towards entrepreneurship or, you know, being that person at a startup who can consult and not just, you know, being like you said, working in that ivory tower. So, um, uh yeah, Personal yeah. PhD, that's what it was called. Thank you, thank you. Because yeah. I don't know, like I was doing all my research uh, for, the, for this episode and I'm just like, what was the name? I even Googled my old like Wayne State email addresses to try to find yeah. like, yeah, but uh, okay, versatile PhD. I love that yeah. you remember yes. that. I love mm -hmm. that you remember that. Yeah. Right, right, was, right. Uh, yeah, that was, you know, um, the thing about, so that for, for, for the audience that's out there and for your listeners that may be in academia or whatever the case may be, especially if you're down, uh, uh, if you're going down the PhD track, understand Both that you my friends, <laughs> I swear. There we go. Okay, shout um, out to Donnie, to Nick, <laughs> to Laura, <laughs> and uh, all of the, <laughs> everybody else, all from yeah. Wayne and all, uh, local areas too, so, <laughs> okay. Very dope, very dope, very dope. But it's important to understand that like, you're not just relegated to go down the academic route, down the tenure professorship. Your mentors will try to like steer you down that road. And the reality is because that's all they know. That's all they know as to how to train. They don't have the resources nor the time to like figure out how to get you an industry job or in the public sector, right? So, but what and, and another thing that I think a lot of PhD struggle with is that like you create this extensive CV of what you're doing. So you don't have too much time to gain experience. And that's one of the biggest things. As and and, and this might suck to hear because it's gonna it's gonna require more time invested in the space. But if you're in academia doing research, I know how busy that is and I know how much time that can take, but be intentional about gaining experience so that once you are ready to start applying for jobs, um, you have something on your resume that can let the employer know that you at least have some sort of experience, even if it is an internship. And I know Wayne State, 
now provides certain programs that helps PhDs go down that path in the STEM and in the soft sciences. Um, but I was very intentional doing that. And that sometimes came at a sacrifice because I wasn't as close with my department or my peers in my department, but I was also very intentional about keeping the relationships with my mentors and professors strong. So even though I may not have hung out with my peers from the political science department like that, I made sure that I was still very close with my mentors, those who literally have my, you know, my uh, graduation or my ability to defend and complete the program in their hands, right? Like, so even in that, you know, PhDs, it's, there's politics involved in that, right? And um, there's politics in academia, really. Um, oh, yeah. Is, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah learning how to maneuver and, and do all that. And also just know through the program, you're not just getting a doctorate in your field. Even though it's highly specific, there are a lot of transferable skills that you're gaining. To go through any PhD program means that you then develop skills to, to have um, high information processing. You can learn quickly, you can write, you can analyze data, you can, um, you can teach, you can communicate complicated information into simple things. And these are all skills that are highly sought out in 2022 in this day and age. Right, right. Very valuable skill sets. And, um, you know, I, I just think that, um, I don't know, I serve on the Wayne State University Alumni Association Board. And that's one thing that I wish that going forward, the next generation of, you know, students can can get that, that sort of what we ended up getting out of NLC, which is New Leaders Council and the Michigan Political Leadership Program, NPLP, that cohort, that camaraderie and that sense of, okay, these people have my back. And these are people I can depend on. They're going to support me. And I think that's something that I'd love for the universities to make sure that for like graduate level students, they have, you know, because I know going to Wayne State for grad and undergrad, undergrad, I did feel like I got a little bit more of that. And, you know, those, those long lasting relationships and networks. And I think that that's really, really valuable. In addition, that, that ability to network and to meet people in, you know, those impactful ways. Mm -hmm. And I, and I was going to add to, you had asked earlier, whether policy and politics was always something that I was interested in. And I answered no, but what ended up happening with me being intentional about throwing myself in those spaces to practice practically what I was learning is that I grew a love for politics and policy, which not only, which ended up helping both my work in the practical space, whether I was working for a nonprofit or community organizing or, um, <clears throat> you know, running a political campaign, right? Um, or, and it also helped my work in my actual PhD because I became more passionate about it. I, be, I became really invested in it. And I think a lot of the time when people are going through whatever program it is that you're going through, sometimes you may lack that passion that can make the work that much better. Um, and that passion is not just gonna come from anywhere. Sometimes it comes from really investing yourself in something. All right, that was beautifully said. And it actually, you segue right into, you know, the, you know, the question I have for you. Right now, you're at Citizens Research Council, and, you know, you do a lot of work around policy. And although you said, you know, that wasn't something that drew you in initially. And, you know, I, I, I want to sort of ask about what was it that made you want to you know, just kind of focus on this, this particular, I mean, you, you expounded on that, but um, I think that fiscal matters and, you know, the, the policies that impact Detroiters, you um, talked about like the Detroit, Detroit's municipal bankruptcy. So what are some things you want people to understand most about um, the impact of, you know, just fiscal matters in Detroit as a whole and Metro Detroit as, you know, just a greater region? Yeah. Well, this 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 is a hard question for me because there's so many layers. Um, there's a lot of nuance um, and there's a lot we could talk about um, in terms of what I would want lis listeners to know or what's important. But I would say this. So 
one, we I focus so much on fiscal policy because at the Citizens Research Council, <clears throat> our bread and butter is always to relate, bring everything back to the fiscal impact on government of whatever sort of policy issue, valid mm -hmm. proposal, or whatever the case may be that we're focusing on. Um, because ultimately, that is what is important with government, money, right? That is always the inherent fundamental um, issue that creates the politics of government, right? Okay. Um, how much money does government have and how are we going to spend it? Who, what, when, and why? That mm -hmm. is the definition of politics. Who gets what, when, and why, and how? Um, and so... You know, I, I, I think for, you know, Detroit is now, like you mentioned, almost 10 years removed from municipal bankruptcy. We officially started it's like 2013. And um, I know that like we've been looking at because uh, I was working with Detroit City Council briefly, and we were examining like the 2023 budget. And it's yeah. almost like this full circle looking at, you know, oh, wow, it 10 years out. Yeah, yeah. So we, we filed for bankruptcy in 2013. And we were going through the grand bargain and all that during 2013. And then it was 2014, where um, Judge Rhodes settled on the bankruptcy agreement um, that then started this 10 year reprieve that is going to be over next year. Okay. So what that, what that means is that next year, to put it in plain terms, Detroit is going to have to start paying back debts that it's not had, that have been deferred for the last 10 years. And that, that was the bankruptcy agreement in essence, right? And those debts are pension obligations, pensions that um, pensioners have not received for the last 10 years or have been drastically cut down. Um, so that's a big moment, right? And the reason why we have seen a lot of the progress that the city has gone through in the last 10 years, it's because it's had that debt been deferred. And so investments have been able to be made in ways that could not have happened if we still had to pay back that debt or worry about that debt, or even if that debt was scaled down in 2013, we would have still had to worry about that debt, right? Um, and so the city is in a good financial place to do that. Um, the current administration, the Duggan administration has employed a lot of responsible fiscal practices to get us in this place that we are right now um, in terms of, you know, our, our so the city budget, city revenues are at a surplus right now, right? Um, so what would be, I'm sorry, um, I just, no, just for clarity, like what would be an example of like some of the Duggan administration's like, um, you know, kind of intuitive, um, you know, measures or policies that were put in place that kind of made things better or stabilize the situation? Yeah, so let me, let me start off by saying that Duggan just did not have to deal with the debt that the bankruptcy agreement um, mm -hmm. took away from the city, right? So Duggan's, D Duggan's responsibility, and this is why he made this his rallying cry, right? As he got elected in 2014 was that my goal and the way you measure my success is to grow the population. Sorry, that's, that's our cockapoo. Um, oh, so cute. <laughs> um, but the reason why that is a measure of success, the reason why that is a benchmark is because growing a population grows a tax base. And that is inherently what the goal for the city was in these last 10 years. So that by the time the city has to get back to paying those pension obligations, we have a stronger, big enough tax base that can contribute to the tax revenue and to, that can contribute to the revenues that the city gets into its budget, right? Um, because over the last seven decades, there has been persistent population decline in the city. And persistent population declines creates problems for cities, right? The, the, the census total- tax base and you know, you're yeah. not getting funding from that, that census information. And so just all of those issues compounded. And so what, 
some examples of what the Duggan administration has done, for example, is that it is, it has, in essence, created savings accounts, for example, like the Retiree Protection Fund, um, th that hundreds of millions of dollars have been deposited into that savings account as a way to cushion the blow for when the city has to start paying back those pension debts come next year, right? That okay, was created gotcha. in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, rainy day funds. Most municipalities have rainy day funds, but just being very intentional and conservative about the amount of money that goes into the rainy day fund. A rainy day fund is essentially like the name suggests. It's a, it's, it's a bank account for municipalities that are accessed when municipalities are going through hard times, such right. as well, a COVID-19 or something like that, right? Um, and so those are just examples of good fiscal practice that this administration has done to put the city in a better position uh, once, the, once this bankruptcy agreement is over with. Um, and, you know, also, the tax base has grown, right? So between 2010 and 2020, we still lost 10.5% 10 of the population based on the census, 2020 census, but that is better than 20, that is better from, two, that is better than 2000, 2010 when we lost 25% of the population during that time, right? So we haven't stopped the bleeding, but the bleeding is slowing down. There are more people moving into the city, you're seeing development in the city. Um, all these things contribute to the tax base. And so, you know, I, the city is in a good place, but the city has to continue practicing and being very careful about the kind of spending that it, that it is doing now so that once those payment or pension obligations have to start getting paid starting next year, we can continue being on this path of, of having the budget balanced or having the surplus in the budget. Um, oh, and another thing that really helped, right? As a part of the bankruptcy agreement, um, the city is obligated to have revenue estimating conferences where in which our three major research institutions oh. collaborate with each other to, to provide projections of the city's revenues over over several years, right? So over a four year span, and a lot of the time too, they will it will be a far reaching time period too, like over ten years. And so, the city is not able to spend above the revenues that are projected in those reports in those revenue est estimating conferences, and that has certainly provided the administration with more security in the decisions it makes when spending, um, you know, and, and when investing and, and how to go about just running government. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that, that was actually really insightful because, you know, you wonder, and I, this was initially my last question, but, um, you know, how can other cities avoid this same situation? How can other cities even, you know, project, say you got yourself out of the situation and Detroit has been doing a, a great job of, you know, turning this whole situation around and, you um, you know, I guess I'll, I'll just delve right into it now. Um, you know, I mentioned that documentary gradually, then suddenly, and telling the story of the bankruptcy and telling like how we got there and, you know, telling about the being in the midst of it and, you know, all of these decisions and then having, you know, all of these sort of, um, you know, foundations come to the rescue. And then with the DIA, if we didn't have, you know, that, that the, the treasures there in the DIA, where we, we have been and, you know, and all of the, the elements that led to this and took us out of this, you know, I wonder as a former city council person who has, you know, spent time looking at municipal budgets, like what can other cities do to prevent themselves from getting into a situation like this if they see themselves going down a path of population decrease and you know the tax base isn't as robust and there aren't as many businesses and you know you start to see all of the elements that led to the bankruptcy 
happening in your community per se? What yeah. can other places do to prevent this? And, you know, I, I wanted to ask about those like provisions that, you know, the Duggan administration put in place because, you know, you just kind of want to know, like, how can you replicate that if another municipality is in the same situation? For sure. Well, I guess I'd start by saying that <clears throat> it's important to know that the bankruptcy, that Detroit's bankruptcy was not a result of like a couple of years or even 10 years of things building up, right? And I think often there is perhaps a narrative that, for example, even the Kilpatrick administration drove us into bankruptcy. That's just not true. The bankruptcy was a product of six decades of multiple factors playing and working like in confluence with each other, right? So, you know, population decline as a result of the industrialization and suburbanized suburbanization and white flight, um, the exodus of wealth from the city and the concentration of poverty in the city, which ends up whenever you have something like that happen, tax rates go higher because as the tax base decreases and when a tax base decreases, especially in urban centers, the, the city has to find a way to continue to make the revenue that it was making when its tax base was larger and when they were in the, and, and when that tax base had more, more income in that tax base, right? And so what does it have to do? It has to raise taxes. And that creates a situation where then you have a city with high concentrations of poverty, have high rates of high tax rates, which contributes to population decline and then de delinquency and foreclosure. Like there, there's just so many domino effects that happen. And, and then of course, yes, city mismanagement, city mismanagement with money, right? Um, how the city spent money, we were spending money we didn't have necessarily, right? And all of this also was happening around a time where the country as a whole was headed into a historic recession that was um, almost comparable to the Great Depression, right? Um, and Michigan's recession started years before, earlier in the 2000s, before the entire country got into the Great Recession. And so, Number one, it is important to know that that kind of historic bankruptcy happens over time. And right. it doesn't it doesn't just rush and all of a sudden hit you. It's it's um, suddenly like, oh, here it is. And but it's a gradual process. Just like the documentary mentions gradually, then suddenly. Mm -hmm. Great documentary, by the way. Very good documentary. I would uh, recommend for everyone who hasn't seen it to see it. But, you know, I like cities can cities should take Detroit as an example of 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 should learn from Detroit as a case study, right? Should learn um, that, for example, balancing bu balancing a budget or working from a balanced budget is extremely important, right? Be mindful of the kind of government spending that you do. You don't want to spend money that you don't have. What that means is, for example, um, investing in programs or departments that that may require years of spending or investment. If you don't, if you don't have the revenue or the tax base to fund that kind of uh, program, don't invest in it. Be more mindful about or 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 see if there are other alternatives to providing some sort of a pro some program or policy. Um, have good fiscal practice, right? Uh, I think that these revenue estimating conferences that the city is privy to, um, and we're fortunate enough to have Wayne State, Michigan State, and U of M contribute to those reports, but have that same sort of practice. Look for, project, have a forward vision or, 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 or um, you know, have these practices of projecting how much revenue you think you might have in four, two years, four years, five years, 10 years. Um, and, you know, uh, right now, it's interesting because most governments, state, county, and local actually have an influx of money uh, from, from federal stimulus. And so right now is a great opportunity to make investments in areas that can 
provide transformational change. And I don't mean in creating departments or programs that, again, are going to require spending down the line, long-term spending, but making very concerted investments in the community, in infrastructure, in public health that can spur the kind of development that would then grow a tax base or want individuals to come live in that municipality. Um, and so that's a hard question to ask. How can other cities avoid these issues? Uh, that's a hard question to answer. How can cities avoid these issues? But it's, you know, it's just being more mindful about the money and the resources that you have to work with and incentivizing that your municipality can contribute to a person's quality of life um, because it's ultimately the residents of that municipality that create the wealth for that city, not the other way around. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I think it's interesting that you opened up by saying that, you know, Detroit can be this case study because I was recently on a panel where the Kansas City Chamber came to Detroit to learn from Detroit. They were learning, they wanted to learn how to spur economic development, how to support entrepreneurs. And there was a whole panel of us, you know, um, who are Detroiters working, whether it's for um, the state of Michigan, working for the, for Wayne County and, you know, working with other organizations that focus on economic development, this group was like, they were ravenous. They wanted information from us. And they were just like, the whole tour was a just visit Detroit, get to know Detroit and to understand, you know, the essence and essence of what we went through. And they were curious about all of these things. And, you know, so I do think that, um, like you said, it really takes that kind of transformative sort of, you know, those policies and, you know, just really getting in there and spurring, um, you know, all of the things that we're doing in Michigan. And I think we've been kind of getting ready for, you know, we learned from the recessions, like the state was in this recession itself. And we've learned from, you know, uh, the 2008 financial crisis that hit the state a little harder. And we've had to rebound from that in addition to, you know, um, one of our largest cities going through, you know, this, this bankruptcy. And so um, I really think that this is information that the rest of the world is going to have its eyes on Detroit to examine like the way that we've been able to rebound, the way that the state has been able to turn around the economy and to, you know, incentivize doing business here to attract jobs, to retain talent. And so that actually um, brings me right into, I was actually really surprised to see like CNBC did this whole thing about Detroit. Um, it was a um, short documentary. You see these little YouTube shorts um, talking about why Detroit is tearing down a highway and, you know, just kind of uh, the plans for uh, 375 and you were quoted. And I was just like, I know that guy. There was a quote from you, uh, you know, from uh, the Citizens Research Council. And, you know, you were quoted as saying Detroit um, Detroit spending will outpace its projected revenue growth um, growth as soon as fiscal year 2027. So, um, you know, I know that you've got a lot of research around this and you've touched on some of these elements, but, um, you know, what are some of the biggest takeaways you want people to know about, um, you know, and I, I, I do think that you did, you know, really get into, you know, this indirectly, but, you um, you know, it, it just, I think to reiterate and drive home, you know, the message of what can we do to continue to keep an eye on this. And then I think for cities who want to learn from, you know, us, other cities that are in Michigan and, you know, how we can stay ahead of this curve and, and pre prevent this sort of, um, you know, revenue growth uh, being outpaced. Yep. Yep. And so, what I wanted to quickly add <clears throat> before I jump on that question is, you know, something, something for the audience and listeners to also know is that it's not just incumbent for, um, it's it's not all credit to or just incumbent to city government to, um, bring to to have brought Detroit to where it's at now, right? Detroiters are also very resilient, very unique, very. And and there we have a strong advocacy and grassroots base in, in the city. There's there's strong community engagement um, 
you know, we have a strong nonprofit and foundation space in Detroit. There is this energy of Detroit versus everybody, Detroiters and all those, all those entities that I just mouthed off collaborate and have collaborated with each other over these last 10 years to bring the city back out of the ashes. And so, you know, there's a lot of credit that has to go there as well. And, um, you know, without that sort of energy and that persistent and resilient work towards making your city what it should great, um, we wouldn't be able to be here, right? And so, to respond to your question about Detroit spending outpacing projected revenue growth as soon as fiscal year 2027. So that is um, in May of this year, I published a analysis of Detroit's fiscal year 2023 budget. Um, and so that, th that long-term budget forecast does project that ongoing revenue growth will not be sufficient to meet the estimated spending pressures that are coming up in the near future. And this forecast is based on a number of assumptions, but the good news is, is that it presents a small but growing operating budget shortfall. Um, the original analysis mentioned 2027, but as recent as July, uh, updated numbers of the actual revenues that the city got from 2022 now make me say that that budget shortfall is going to be extended out for another two years, fiscal year 2029, which is a good thing. Um, and it's because the revenues that the city uh, collected in fiscal year 2022 were much higher than projected. Um, and that's a lot of that is based on municipal income tax growth, casino wagering tax growth, um, and increased funding from state revenue sharing. Um, and so that is a good thing. But you know, some takeaways from that analysis are first, number one, um, you know, the city has its the, its municipal income revenue is increasing because a lot of the development jobs that are coming to the city, job growth in the city is increasing and a lot of that is credited to blue collar industry jobs. There are a lot of big development projects going on, the uh, construction of the Gordy Howe Bridge, uh, the new Ford Motor Campus, um, the Stellantis Avenue plant. Um, all of these projects are creating jobs in the blue collar service industries, which is driving up the municipal income tax in the city for the near future. Um, and that is why we are, that is why, that is why we are seeing the kind of revenue surplus that we're seeing in that space. Um, so while it's possible that the city will gain tax revenue from these development projects that are under underway, the risk of failing to reach revenue targets to not hit a budget shortfall is still more significant. And you know the budget does face some significant revenue risks, um, which should be monitored to avoid the disruption of the current balance that we're seeing between ongoing revenues and expenses. And some of these risks include slower than projected growth in general fund revenues, slower than anticipated employment and wage growth, uh, the persistence of remote work models. That is something that, um, you know, is a product of COVID-19 and the pandemic, more individuals working remotely, and that will, that will impact municipal, municipal income tax revenue. Um, the reason why these big blue collar development jobs are creating a surplus in the income tax is because you have to work, you have to come to work and work in the city. And right, you have to park there, you, you have, have to, to go and there. you're going to buy lunch and you're going to, you know, contribute to the local economy in that area where it's like, you know, pre pandemic, we were going downtown, we'd have to, you know, we'd have a group lunch, we would, you know, pay for other things because, you know, you're moving around, but when you're at home that you know you're not it's not the same you know contribution to you know the local economy yep and, and and the city the city levies different tax rates for individuals that um work uh you know live and work in the city and for individuals that just work in the city for so um it's 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 they they levy double on residents who live and work in the city rather than if you just work in the city and live 
in the suburbs or something like that. Um, also, the economic impacts from changing workplace and consumer behavior can impact revenues, um, reductions in local funding from state and federal government, additional COVID-19 variant related economic disruptions, and of course, the impacts that inflation, this war in Ukraine is having and continued supply chain issues. All these things can impact our, the revenues that the city gets. And so all of those assumptions and projections is how that budget shortfall number was projected. And based on the most recent numbers that we have received, it's safe to say that that budget shortfall is now most likely going to come in fiscal year 2029 rather than fiscal year 2027. So that's a good thing. Um, second, the city must remain proactive to maintain its balanced budget in the near future. Um, Detroit's long-term baseline, like we just mentioned, outpaces the forecasted revenue growth that we're even seeing for fiscal year 2029. So what does that mean? We're the current administration or whatever subsequent administration that comes after Duggan is just going to have to be really mindful about continuing the kind of fiscal practices that the city has been privy to over the last 10 years um, and just really, really aggressively continue to monitor the city's spending um, over the kind of revenue that it is getting. Um, the city's reliance on one-time revenues is also a big takeaway from my report that I that I published. And what I mean about that is, you know, over since since the bankruptcy agreement, there are a lot of initiatives and programs in the city have been funded by one-time spending. Kind of like a, an example of one-time spending would be just like, oh, we've got ARPA funds, you know, the American Rescue Plan, and we've got this. And so yes. when we anticipate that, we're going to plan for, and you've got a few of those that were lined up over a 10-year period. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So like, for example, blight remediation programs, right? So, you know, it's extremely important that the city continues to work towards like removing and addressing blight. Right. But, you know, that that there's going to be a question of 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 infrastructure and personnel services that are going to have to <clears throat> subsequently follow the blight that is removed. And right now, blight remediation is, <clears throat> excuse me, is addressed through bonding. Right. Or one time. Uh, that's what I was going to just ask about, like, like how like then that's when you have to dip into your bonds. And if you have like a certain bond rating, then it's it could be riskier from my understanding. Is that right? If you have a certain bond rating, you're less likely to get essentially a bond from or or a loan. Right. Um, from your you're you're less likely to get credit, basically. Right. So it, it's like uh, your bond rating is kind of like your credit history. Right. Um, but so, you know, for example, ARPA spending, like you just mentioned, you know, um, the right to counsel program that city council just passed, while extremely important and transformative, is also funded by ARPA dollars and philanthropic money. And there's no yet set in stone plan for how that program will be funded in the long term. So that presents an issue, right? That presents an issue in terms of <clears throat> the city spending and in terms of residents relying on such a program and what's gonna happen once those ARPA dollars dry out um, and once the philanthropic money is not there in the way that it needs to be. So um, a final takeaway too is that, you know, the city's annual pension contributions are set to resume in 2024. Once the, retire, once the retiree protection fund is exhausted, which is essentially the savings account that I was speaking about that the Duggan administration had created in 2018 um, and has been depositing hundreds of millions of dollars into that account to cushion the blow uh, once the pension payments need to start being made next year. Once that account is exhausted, pensions and those pension obligations are gonna have to be paid from our general fund. And that's gonna eat up about 20% of the general fund. That's a significant number. And so, you know, just really paying attention to the kind of spending obligations the city has and the kind of revenues that the city is taking in right now. 
Okay. Well, we, we're going to keep our eyes, you know, uh, you know, just kind of like zeroing in on all of this and making sure that, um, and I think that's, that's also something people voters should pay attention to, you know, um, making sure that they're, you know, keeping vote leaders in office who are, or looking for new leaders who are going to pay attention to this and, uh, you know, the appointments that are then over these departments. And so, um, you know, just kind of staying in the loop because this is important, um, you know, to keep us from getting into sticky situations like this um, in the future and, you know, just kind of being preventative now. So um, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and for, you know, giving us such insight into, you know, I don't know, like, I think that sometimes people's eyes glaze over when it comes to, you know, talking about finances and research and, you know, fiscal policy and policy in general. I'm such a policy wonk there. It's just like, no, this is really exciting. And, you know, I think we have to open people's eyes to it. And I think that's something you said about something that a PhD can do outside of academia, which is to teach people about the nuances and the, the you know, break things down in digestible ways so yep. that people can walk away with a fully informed picture of like, oh, well, this is why this is important. And this is the, you know, even being mindful of our history, being mindful of what happened in the past, you know, is important to kind of keep that at top of mind for folks. So um, yep. thank you so much for all of the research you do and uh, continuing to, you know, just kind of give, give these insights and, um, you know, uh, letting, letting, letting us know how to, how to stay one step ahead. So, um, and thank any you. closing thoughts or anything you want to say to, to folks, let me see if there's any questions out here. We did have a couple of folks join us live. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, you know, just, <clears throat> just wanting to say that the city is in a good place. The city is, uh, the city recovered strongly from the pandemic, stronger than anticipated. Um, you know, the city is experiencing positive economic growth right now. So that's good. And so um, we just want to keep working towards that, keeping that consistent and sustainable. Okay. Thank you, everybody out there for watching us live. And... Okay, I stopped the live stream and uh, thank you so much, Esmat, for coming on uh, the Quick to Politics show, uh, the social commentary show, which this week is actually sponsored by Ernest Tea, which is a wonderful uh, tea company founded by yours truly. <laughs> Nice. So of course, I got to plug my own business. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I just think that you have had such an interesting path towards, you know, not only being a researcher and, you know, putting in so much effort, but then also translating it into something that's digestible and um, explainable and, you know, just kind of like giving us these um you know, charts and sound bites and quotes and things that can, you know, kind of be trans transformative, <laughs> you know, as you mentioned. And I think that's essentially like why I think it's important to, to be a person who, you know, kind of takes something away from academia and then gives it to people in a way where it's not just like, I'm in my ivory tower, I do theoretical research, but I'm just like, what are you doing with your life? I mean, like, <laughs> no offense to anybody, but it's just, <laughs> we need to make sure that these kind of things, because we can't have our brightest and best, you know, really just kind of taking information and siloing it. We yep. should have that okay. information be available to the masses. And um, I, I know that, you know, once upon a time in America, we had our, our we attracted our brightest and best into public service. And people wanted to go into, you know, serving government. And it wasn't necessarily about, you know, the money. It was more about, I want to bring my talent and expertise to make great things. I want to, as an engineer, I want to help build roads for, you know, our infrastructure. And I think that now the brightest and best are, you know, either in academia or you've got them going into the private sector working for, you know, uh, you know, these tech companies and things like that. And, you know, right. it, it's just, we have to create a middle for folks who can continue to, especially the next generation. And uh, we're both millennials. And, you know, I really think that it's, it's kind of up to us to take on that 
torch that take take on the torch and keep on going so keep it moving for sure no and thank you for having me on your show and like you said i think these are very important conversations to have and the more you know millennials like us have these kind of conversations i also think it creates that kind of interest um in millennials or in the younger generation and of course it gets the it it keeps the conversation going in a in a different perspective more thoughtful and fresh way and so i appreciate everything you do as well uh you know in terms of of course your public service and and providing this kind of outlet for individuals to hear these kind of conversations super important and you know there are not enough people doing that so thank you awesome oh thank you thank you i don't know sometimes i wonder i'm like ah, is anybody listening but thank you listeners who are here <laughs> and, uh, hopefully you take away some nuggets of wisdom and you feel inspired by you know not only hearing the stories of folks like esma um but you know you can take something and just like i want to change the world incrementally in my own way as well so um thank you again and that's it for the recording